Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today for our Learn at Home live lesson. We're talking about Fruit Trees 101 with a very special guest from a very important and long-term Tree People partner. So we're very excited to have um, everybody here and look forward to the presentation by our guest speaker. So Learn at Home is our virtual programming that we started back in March at the onset of uh, this pandemic and we've been doing this for you know a, a months now and so if you've been following us from the beginning thank you so much we can't do this without your support um, special thank you to seed funding provided by the Jean Aubacon Senator Legacy Fund for supporting this program as well as Subaru of Sherman Oaks for supporting Learn at Home and if you're new today Thank you for tuning in. Let us know in the chat how you heard about um, this talk. And our Learn at Home program is something that we decided to do um, when we could no longer host volunteer events because we're still, you know, very, very community focused and and um, engaging with the public is really important for Tree People's mission. So we are bringing you, you know, relevant topics such as fruit trees. We also had a uh, fire week previously and oak week. Uh, we've talked about waste. We've talked about urban heat. We've talked about tree care. Um, we have a long list of topics that we've covered at this point. And we're, our audience is growing more and more every time. So thank you for joining here today. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. My name is Emmy and I am your moderator. I'll be moderating the Q&A and also just here to help with tech support if necessary. I also have other trees people staff. Thank you for supporting today. And our guest speaker, Daniel Nelson, who is the director of operations at Laverne Wholesale Nursery. So I'll pass it along to Daniel to introduce himself. Hi, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm with uh, Lover Nursery, um, have been for going on uh, 21 years now. And um, I wanna thank Emmy and uh, Chris and everybody for, in, for inviting me to speak with all of you. Um, we're gonna go over a few topics today. We'll get through as much as we can. Um, I'll give you a little history on Laverne Nursery. We'll talk about grafting fruit trees because most fruit trees are grafted and why. We'll talk about the soil, water, and fertilizer that it takes to grow a tree. We'll touch a little bit on diseases and then uh, just some general maintenance of your fruit trees. Um, so I'm ready to go. So I'm going to uh, take away the screen share completely and just pin you as the main speaker. Okay. So I'm not, I hope this is going to work for everybody. Is this uh, showing up on everybody's main screen Dan, uh, as, as Daniel being your main screen? Let me know in the chat. Yes. Okay, I'm seeing thumbs up. Great. So now you're the main speaker and, and take us away. Okay. Oh, and sorry, one more thing I forgot to mention. We will be having a Q&A session after the, the main talk. And because um, Daniel may answer your question, you know, throughout uh, his talk. We have a document to place your questions in to, because if we use a chat, it might get lost in the chat. So I'm going to put that link in the chat. And if you have questions throughout the talk, then place it in this document and we'll be addressing the questions after the talk um, in a Q and A, Q and A segment. All right. The floor is Great. all yours. So um, I, I'll start out with a little bit of history of Laverne Nursery. Um, mo most of you fruit growing people know of Laverne Nursery because we've been around since 1974 in, in Southern California. Um, the name Laverne came from the town of Laverne. We started in, in Laverne and uh, San Dimas area, like I said, in 1974. Um, I was brought on with Laverne Nursery after um, obtaining my ornamental horticulture degree at Cal Poly. Um, in 2000, and um, I've been here ever since. We started moving to uh, Ventura County, a little town named Piru, in about two, right around 2000 when I got hired, and um, we were fully moved up here by about 2002, 2003. Um, as you might imagine, moving in large 
scale nursery takes obviously years. Um, we moved up here for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one of the big reasons was all of the property we were growing on in the, uh, down in, in the San Gabriel Valley was um, leased property with Southern California Edison or the water company, et cetera. And um, those leases just got more and more expensive. And the um, price of water was cut in about um, one tenth of what we were paying down in the San Gabriel Valley as to what we were um, pulling it out of the ground up in Ventura County for. So those are some major considerations when, when you run a nursery, obviously. Um, right now we are growing on about 75, 78 acres. Um, at, a, at any given time that, that gives us the ability to have anywhere from uh, 750 to 900,000 plants on the ground at any one time. Um, we serve all of independent nurseries in Southern California, um, the box stores, the Home Depots, the Lowe's, the Costco's, you've seen us all there. Um, we also go into all of Nevada, all of Arizona, parts of New Mexico, parts of Utah, and I've also sold all around the world different sized plants um, from uh, the um, Dubai to uh, Nigeria to um, several places in South America. So there's, there's a, a long history with Laverne Nursery being a supplier, a wholesale supplier of uh, fruit trees. One thing I do want to say, and I'll um, pat myself a little bit on the back with our fruit trees, and if you want to look and make sure that you're buying a Laverne Nursery tree, for instance, at um, Lowe's or at Home Depot, they don't typically, they typically have their own labels on there. It's real hard to tell who grew the plant and um, if you look at the sticker on the can, it's by law, they're supposed to be a grown by, and um, you'll see either Laverne Nursery or Grown in Piru, that's us. Um, there's other people out there that supply those stores, and um, there's nothing wrong with their plants either. So I, it's, a, it's a wide open industry, and I think most of us do a good job with it. Um, I'll go onto our website, LavernNursery.com. And um, like I've mentioned, we're a wholesale to the trade only. Um, you can enter in your zip code on the website and that'll give you uh, an idea of who sells our plants in your area. So you can just click on those. Um, it'll list the independent nurseries and also the um, box stores that carry our material. Um, let's see. So Laverne Nursery grafts fruit trees, and that's, that's been their business um, pretty much since the beginning. And the, there's a few different reasons you graft a fruit tree. Um, one is the rootstock of the, any particular variety you're looking for is um, not as strong as a rootstock that we can graft on. Um, there's other reasons that, um, for instance, uh, if you were to plant an orange seed, the possibility of that orange coming out exactly like the uh, piece of fruit that you harvested the seed from is very unlikely. Um, you'll have some kind of cross between the two parents that created that seed. So um, all of the um, navel oranges in the world all came from one navel orange tree. Washington na parent, not Washington navel tree is still um, alive and doing well in the city of Riverside. You can go visit it. Right now it's under a tent that is growing to protect it from um, Asian citrus psyllid and unlong Bing disease, which I'll talk about later. Um, so it's there. The original Haas tree, which all Haas avocados came from, um, died here about 10 years ago. And that was, um, I think the last one, the one that all of the material came from was out here in Ventura County. Um, in the Brokaw nursery area. So uh, it's amazing to think the millions of trees that um, I've grafted over my career and, and some of them have come from one specific tree. Um, but that's why we graft, to make sure that we get that particular piece of fruit. I can sell you a tree, a grafted tree, an avocado tree that is a Haas avocado. And I know it's a Haas avocado because I'm grafting a fruiting piece of scion onto a rootstock. Um, some uh, examples of grafting. This is a uh, Valencia orange. And if you see, I think you can see the, the division here between this being the rootstock and this being the cyanwood. The green is, is very obviously different. 
um, the bark has started to grow on the, uh, on the understock and that's why it's a darker color. Eventually the uh, green cyan wood will turn that same way. You can see that this was a cleft graft. We just split, we cut the rootstock off, split it down the center, and then you do the opposite to the cyan wood and you and, um, stick it in there. This happens to be a loquat that we had just grafted and then we wrap it with a rubber band like that, nice and tight. The idea is that you get the two vascular systems, the vascular system from the cyan wood and the vascular system from the, um, the rootstock to join and then that piece of cyan will start growing and give you the desired fruit. Um, all the, they also graft ornamental trees as well for flowers and um, different reasons as well. So it's not just um, fruiting trees. As you can see on this one, and this is kind of important for you uh, growing your own fruit trees as this will happen to you on occasion. You can see that this is a nice fruit tree. You can see the graft in it. It's been done, it looks really nice. And then this foliage that I'm covering up here is called a trifoliate. And you see the leaf, there's three in a row, tri and then foliate is leaves. This is all understock. You don't want it on your tree and it just very easily comes off. And if it doesn't come off that easy on your tree, you can go ahead and cut it with a uh, pruners or with a saw as well. But you don't want your trifoliate growing on your, on your fruiting tree. Um, <clears throat> so um, then, then people wonder about um, grafting. So I, you know, I've got a, a, a citrus tree and I wanna have uh, an avocado. You cannot, grow, you cannot cross families. Um, you can't go from an avocado to an, an orange tree or um, a cherimoya to an avocado. The, the, um, the families, the, the, the physiology of the tree is just too um, different and they won't graft together. Um, now, that being said, you've seen some very interesting um, uh, graphs from the uh, day coming out of Dave Wilson and other nurseries, but mainly Dave Wilson and the um, Zeiger family who did all the crossing for Dave Wilson. So for instance, you'll, you'll see an aprium for sale. Well, that's an apricot and a plum together. Um, and what, what has been done there is that they cross pollinated the flowers and came up with the seed and they plant that seed. And then they grow that up thousands and thousands of times over and over and over. And they may get one or two out of those up to tens of thousands of seed seedlings that they like the fruit, they like the way the plant is growing, and then we start grafting off from those. Um, some of the other uh, examples would be a nectar plum, that's a nectarine and a plum. As you see, these are all stone fruits, so they're all within the same family, so you can keep them together. Um, a picotum, a peach, apricot, and a plum. Um, a pluri, which by the way, I, I got the taste at uh, Dave Wilson when they first came out with it and it's an absolutely wonderful piece of fruit. It's like a big cherry. Um, it's a cross between a plum and a cherry. And then of course you got pluots, which is a plum and an apricot. There are several other ones. Um, I just touched on a few, but um, those are some of them that uh, you'll see come from Laverne Nursery and um, ultimately that we grow them from Dave Wilson. Let's see, um, I got a question about multi-grafting. Um, so it, being in the business for 20 years, I've, I've seen um, some changes in some um, trends. And right now the trend seems to be where people want one tree with um, several different pieces or several different varieties of fruit on them. Um, we call them, you can call them salad trees, you can call them uh, four and ones, um, three and ones, whatever, how many ever grafts there are on them. Laverne does do some of these in limited quantities. Um, I was doing avocados. They didn't seem to do real well. I think that the different varieties competed too much with each other and um, I wasn't getting a real good, uh, um, I wasn't getting good growery reports back on them. So we kind of backed away from that, but we still do um, multi-grafted uh, citrus trees where we'll do a lemon, a lime, 
on an orange and maybe a mandarin on, on them. The big thing with those is you've got to be um, you've got to be on top of, of pruning with them because otherwise the Eureka lemon being the strongest of those four varieties on the tree will take over the entire tree and slowly but surely kill all the other grafts. Um, people are worried about getting cross um, flavors in the fruit. It can happen. I have not had too much experience with it happening. Um, for instance, your mandarin orange getting sour because it's on with, a, with the lemon. I don't, um, I haven't heard and I don't see a lot of that happening. So I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Um, moreover, make sure that you're paying attention with the pruning to keep the um, stronger grafts at, uh, down under control. Um, one other thing about growing um, fruit trees and grafted fruit trees is the social aspect of it. Um, I'm sure all of you, otherwise you wouldn't all be um, tuning in to learn that or to go through this um, fruit 101. Um, it's, a, it's an exciting thing to do as, as a human growing your own food. And then secondly, to go and share it with people. Um, I, it may just be me, but I get a kick out of offering my neighbors fresh tomatoes out of the garden during the season. Or when I pick a, two garbage bags full of avocados, I like to go distribute them throughout the neighborhood. And all of a sudden I'm the uh, avocado guy for the next few weeks. It, it feels good. I, I don't mind those. Um, those labels that get put on. At the same time, the, the social aspect of it is normally when you give people that uh, food that you've grown, they'll ask you, oh, what kind is this? Where did you get it? What do you, you know, how do you grow this? Oh, I always wanted to try and grow a tree. And you get to, you open up lines of communication with, with your neighbors and, and uh, it's, it, it's a neat, neat way of learning to talk to your neighbors and um, getting to know them. So. I like, uh, I like doing that as well. Um, so let's see, you've bought a tree and, I, and as you all were um, uh, signing in, a lot of you were saying what you grew and, and where you're from. And mostly I see everybody was uh, from Southern California in the, in the San Gabriel or San Fernando Valleys where we've got a lot of clay. Um, it's, it makes growing uh, plants a little bit more difficult but it can still be done. You've got to remember that the, the plants that we're growing these fruit trees are not native to basically our desert climate. Um, we only get you know, 12 to 14 inches of rain on good years and um, normally less than that anymore. So avocados are native to the, uh, the rainforest, uh, Central America, Northern South America. Um, so you, you think about where they grow, it's a lot of humidity, it's um, the soil is definitely not clay. There's very little soil there. Everything that is there that these avocados grow in is layers and layers of leaf litter and dying, decaying um, uh, trees. And that, that is what they grow in. So to keep that in mind, the best thing you can do for your avocado is try and uh, mimic those soil conditions in your own, in your own yard. Um, so you're going to plant a, 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 um, an avocado tree and then you, you know you got kind of clay soil. The best thing you can do with it is mulch. Um, and I'm going to probably mention this more than you want to hear it throughout the talk is mulching is extremely important with any plants, but especially with fruit trees. And remember that um, 80, 80 to 90 percent of your uh, feeder roots are in the top six inches of your soil. So when you allow the top six inches of your soil to dry out, those feeder roots that are there are gonna get a tip burn on them and that's gonna show up on the leaves of your tree. You're gonna have brown edges on your tree. Well, one way of preventing that is by, layer, by getting a good layer of mulch around the tree um, as far out as you uh, choose to go. You'll see in, grow, in groves now, they are mounding trees. They're putting big three foot mounds up in the field and they plant on top of it, and then they'll bring in mulch and put in between, uh, in between these rows. And that is to, to help with soil moisture. It reduces your water easily by 50% that you need, and it maintains a consistent soil moisture. That's the important, that's the important thing with your plants is consistent soil moisture. Um, when we get down to the water, I'm gonna tell you that the most plants that die 
Our diet are killed by kindness because we love to water our plants. You're better off backing off on the water and using a good layer of mulch. Um, we've been saying three by three by three, three inches away from the trunk, three, at least three inches thick, three feet out from the trunk of the tree. Um, that's a good rule of thumb. If you can mulch your entire yard and grow your trees, you're much better off that way. Um, again, with citrus, it's a tropic, uh, it's a plant from the tropics, subtropics of uh, Southeastern Asia, where citrus was born. Um, I know a lot of people think it came from the Mediterranean. It was popularized from the Mediterranean, but originally, um, I think most people will agree that it comes from Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Northern uh, um, Australia, those, those areas over there. Um, so again, you know, our clay soil just doesn't work real well. The hot, dry winds that we get is very hard on these plants. Um, the extreme cold, uh, it was 31 degrees at my house three nights ago. <clears throat> went from 90 two weeks or uh, less than a week ago to 31 degrees overnight. And then the heat extremes as well. Um, two, two or three years ago on 4th of July, we had a just an awful heat wave. And it ended up getting to be 120 degrees here in Peru, which is extremely um, uh, unheard of. And Ventura County, as you may know, is a, um, a, a large avocado growing area. And I was out in a grove um, talking with one of the growers and, and discussing what needs to be done with his trees. And all of a sudden it just, uh, it sounded like a hailstorm. And I started looking around and just from the extreme heat, the, the uh, trees had just decided to drop their fruit. And it was an absolutely amazing um, situation to be standing there and just listening to all this fruit hit the ground. Um, so all of these things that we combat to grow our oranges and our avocados and our cherimoyas and, and uh, peaches. And it, you've got to be very um, cognizant of the water and, and the soil that you're, that you're putting on it. Um, the biggest question I get on, on a week, almost a weekly basis is um, how much water does my tree need? And I wish I had a magic formula that I could tell you that every week you need to put a gallon and a half of water on your tree if it's this tall and so on. It, that just isn't, isn't the reality of it. Um, our climate changes from area to area so much that it's difficult because of that to explain how much water to put on there. The temperature makes a huge difference. Um, a cold wind can take the moisture out of your plant just as fast, if not faster than a hot wind. Um, the physiology of a, a leaf and the stomates that are in it, um, when it's cold, they're wide open and the water will flow fle freely through the tree, um, whereas they tend to be tighter and closed more when it's heat, when the heat is out. But so keep that in mind, a cold wind can really do some damage to your tree as well. Um, So uh, I, it, it all depends on the climate, the temperature, the type of soil, whether the tree is fruiting or not, um, the time of year, there's, there's several different things. So what I suggest to people that are, are getting serious about doing their uh, watering and learning how to do it is get, a, get yourself a soil moisture meter. This just happens to be the one that I use. Um, it's mechanical. It just goes across the top there. It's got a scale on it. Um, there's uh, probably a hundred different types of um, uh, soil moisture meters out there. You can pick them up for five, you know, probably ten, fifteen dollars at a garden store or at uh, one of your box stores, and it will. Um, some of them come with a digital reader and a probe, and you can spend anywhere from ten or fifteen dollars to probably a hundred or two hundred dollars on it. Cheap one will do the job. The big thing is you need to get out there and probe your soil underneath your mulch, see how much water you need. I think you'll be, most people are very, very surprised on how little water they need to be putting on their tree if they've got it mulched and um, they're checking with a soil moisture meter. I typically tell people when the um, soil moisture meter gets to between dry and medium, that's when I water. If it's 
medium and beyond all the way up to wet just let let the tree be and what you're going to notice it would take it'll take you about a season and if you're diligent about it you'll see within that season that you can look at the as you're doing the soil probe look at the tree itself and the tree will tell you when it needs water and when it doesn't and you're only confirming it with the soil probe um, a rule of thumb on water if your leaves are light green or um, yellowy, then typically you're overwatering. You've got too much water going on. If your leaves are um, getting burnt on the edges, then you're either drying out too quickly or you're not putting on enough water. That's a rule of thumb. That, that's something that you can kind of follow. But um, I, I brought some leaves just to show you. This one is kind of yellowy, but if you notice, it's the ribs of the leaves that are dark green. That is not a water issue. These leaves are kind of yellowy looking. They're not real green. They're dark ribs. This is a, a nutrient deficiency. This is something that you need to take care of with fertilizer, not with, not with water. So you can see the difference between a yellowy leaf and one that's nutrient starved. Um, Yeah, so and then and then also when when you've got fruit on the tree, the tree is going to use up more water because the, the tree is converting the, the water into uh, and, and through photosynthesis, the combination of the two, making sugars and packing that into your fruit. Um, a lot of times this year was um, particularly bad with uh, Washington navels, where the oranges are split. I'm sure there's several of you out there that have oranges that split. Typically, that is a water issue. It's either inconsistent water where you're watering it all at once and then letting it dry out too far and then watering it all at once again. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Or um, just not enough water at that time. You need to increase your water during the fruiting season. Again, the mulch will help even out that uh, water demand. Um, let's see. How about fertilizer? Um, I want to, I, I, I'll start with the basics um, on fertilizer and I, I won't go too deep into it, but the three numbers on your fertilizer bag, your conventional fertilizer is NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Nitrogen is for green growth, twigs, branches, leaves. Phosphorus is for um, flowers and for fruit development and potassium is to help the tree absorb the nutrients from the, from the uh, ground. Although I'm sure there's some of you out there yelling, oh no, but this and but that. Yes, there's a lot more to fertilizer than what I'm covering here, but um, with those three basic numbers, you can do a lot to, uh, to help your tree survive. Um, anybody that buys a tree that calls me up, um, by the way, we'll, uh, we'll have my email address and my phone number available for you to give me a call or email is the easier way of getting hold of me. Um, I'm more than happy to answer all of your questions if we don't get to them today. The three numbers, the NPK, um, when somebody calls me and asks me what kind of fertilizer do I, should I put on my tree? Nine times out of 10, I can tell them that you need a triple 10 or a triple 20 when you first plant your tree. And I like a slow release fertilizer. Slow release means that the fertilizer has been coated. And as you water, the, um, the fertilizer breaks down a little bit every time you water. So even if you've got your mulch, you take your handful of slow release fertilizer, you spread it around the base of the tree, whatever the, whatever the bag calls for. And then every time you water, it'll break down a little bit and go into your mulch and then ultimately down into the soil where the, where the um, feeder roots can grab it. Um, I've never burned a tree with slow release fertilizer. And um, I, I think it's, it's a good way for people not to have to think about it more than probably three or four times a year, whatever the bag suggests to, um, to add to your fruit trees. Um, the numbers aren't as important as the ratios. So on a young tree, the first year or two, I'm, I'm working on developing the, the the canopy of the tree. Um, I want a good balance, get a little bit of fruit and flower on it, and also have the, uh, the potassium help absorb all those roots. So I'm going with a triple 10 or a triple 20 or 
triple 15 or 777, what it, whatever you can find that slow release and you add that according to the bag. Then I get people grow, calling me and I, and I saw one earlier that um, somebody had an avocado tree that was not producing avocados. One of the reasons that your tree isn't producing is possibility of uh, lack of phosphorus. The phosphorus helps the flowers set and the fruit develop from there. So that's the first thing I start talking to people about is if they are not fertilizing, that then the tree is mature and they need to get fruit. They need to start setting fruit. They see some flower, but not a lot. And the fruit doesn't set. Usually the easiest place to start with is the um, phosphorus. So then I, I'll tell people, okay, now that your tree's established, let's back off from the triple 10, triple 20, whatever we've been putting on it. And let's go with a 5 10 10 or a 5 20 20 or a 10 20 20. There, you can see that we're backing off from the nitrogen, especially in the drought season. I was telling people to almost eliminate the nitrogen. You just didn't need any more green growth. All you were looking for is, was fruit and flower on your trees. The tree is already established, it's got enough um, nitrogen going. We don't need any more canopy. So you can really back off on that. Typically in Southern California, we've got plenty of nitrogen in the ground. Um, again, slow release. Um, the, <laughs> something I was told many years ago by a, by a grower was the best fertilizer is footprints. And what he meant by that was the best fertilizer being footprints is walking around your tree and looking at it, going through your garden and looking at, at um, what, what the plants are telling you. You'll, you'll get a feel for what your plant is looking for. If it's looking for more nitrogen because it's yellow and and not putting on a lot of uh, canopy, whether it's not putting on enough fruit and flower because it needs more phosphorus. You're out there, you're walking around, you're picking up a few weeds and um, putting footprints on, on the ground around your, uh, around your plants. So best fertilizers footprints. Let's see, any, I haven't seen any questions come through that, um, that I need to order or need to answer. Um, they're all on the dock. So we, we're, oh. we currently actually have like we're getting a lot of questions. We have around 20 questions right now. Okay. So um, I'm thinking we're going to need like at least 20 minutes to go through at least, you know, a good amount of these questions. Okay. And we were talking about an hour. So we're halfway in, half hour in. Yeah. Okay. So I, I can run over diseases real quick and then uh, maintenance, or I can start answering questions. Where were you at? Um, I think it's up to you. Okay. So, I, I'll, let's see the questions, and I'll probably probably um, end up touching a lot on that. Let's see. Yeah, I think if you go over it, you might touch on some of these questions. So feel free to to talk about disease and um, the other topic you were going to talk about. Can you see the questions in the doc? Yeah, yeah. I just said uh, they just came up for me. Thank you. Um, so uh, Laverne Nursery does sell 15 gallon pots. We do not sell to the public. We're a wholesale only um, uh, nursery. So um, like I said, go to the website and look, um, type in your, uh, your zip code and they'll tell you who um, grows our material. I don't sell a lot of 15 gallon grafted mangoes. I do sell the manila, which is still a good piece of fruit. It's a seedling. By the time it gets out on a 15, it's about two, between two and three years old you should start seeing fruit real quickly after that. Um, some of the, uh, my favorite mangoes are Keat and Alfonso, both uh, kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. The Alfonso mango, it came out of uh, India. It's a small yellow one, very, very sweet. Um, it's a lot of work. You got to see a pretty big seed in a mango and you got a pretty small mango there, but it's worth the work. On the other extreme, you've got a Keat mango, which is sometimes up to a two pound mango fruit. Um, I like those quite a bit because you, you get a lot of bang for your buck. Um, fruit trees are going to do best not growing them in pots. Um, you can do it and um, it's been done and people will, you'll get fruit, you won't get near the fruit set that you typically do when you put them in the ground. Um, your backyard is all concrete. Um, goji berries, absolutely, you'll get a good crop of goji berries in a pot, that's not a problem. Um, if you're going to, a pomegranate will do okay in a pot, you'll get a few pieces of fruit. Persimmons are going to be tough. Um, apricots I would probably stay away from. There are some 
super, we call them super dwarfs or um, genetic dwarfs, um, peaches and nectarines that do not get any larger than say um, two or three feet tall, no matter how long you how long you grow them. So those will do okay. Again, you're going to have to be up on your fertilizer, use a slow release fertilizer, and liquid feed every time you water a potted plant, a potted fruit tree. Um, I like to water twice when I water potted fruit trees. I'll come by once, I'll uh, water it real well so the water runs out the um, holes in the bottom. And then about a half hour, hour later, I'll come by and water it again until that happens. You're doing two things. You're soaking the root ball real well all the way through so you don't develop any water channels through the soil. And you're, the other thing you're doing is you're washing the salts that may build up on the side of the plant or in the soil. You're washing those out of the uh, out of the plant. That's why you're going to want to have a, a weak liquid feed. Um, Miracle Grow is one of the ones that come to mind, um, and also a slow release fertilizer when you're growing in a container. Um, the best resource that I have found out for Southern California, and I believe Emmy's going to put the um, uh, the website up for me, is um, IPM, IPM as in integrated pest management dot UCANR, University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources dot edu. They have every kind of uh, disease, a picture of it, what it looks like when it's on your tree, any kind of the pests, and they also suggest uh, what you can do to uh, combat them. So that's a really good one. It's put on by the University of California system. I use it all the time. Um, yeah, I already touched on doing multiple grafts on one tree. We do citrus at this point. I do do a very few uh, stone fruits like that, um, several on one. Squirrels and rats. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> they really like apples too, just like we do. Um, I've seen people put um, steel bands around the trunk of their tree. Typically that's for raccoons, but I would think it would work for um, um, squirrels and rats if that's the only tree in the area. If they can jump from the roof to your tree, um, I, I don't know what to tell you. You gotta find a way of controlling them or you just gotta um, let them have their, uh, <laughs> their, their, their tax of the fruit as well. Um, there's all kinds of rodenticides you can use. Um, people are um, trying to get away from those because of some of the bad effects they'll have on other wildlife. Um, probably try some, uh, I, I don't know if uh, coyote urine would work, but that works for deer. Um, I have sprinkled cayenne pepper on my um, tomato plants to keep the rats and the uh, ground squirrels off from eating them. So you wet the plant down real good and then sprinkle, uh, go to Smart Final or one of those stores and get a big jug of uh, cayenne pepper and sprinkle that on there. Pretty soon they start leaving your stuff alone after taking a bite of that. So um, the Eureka lemon that you have in a pot, again, you'll, you'll get some fruit production in a pot. Um, I know there's there's people out there that that say container fruit growing is wonderful. It's it's difficult at best, and it is not going to produce the yield you would in the ground. That being said, um, it's growing new branches and leaves, but not flowers. It's not going to flower. Give it a chance. Give it till spring. Now it should flower in spring, and then once it starts flowering, it's going to flower almost year round. Um, lemons and limes do that for the most part in Southern California. Um, try the uh, phosphorus fertilizer. Look for uh, the high phosphorus. That's the second number on the bag and um, give that a shot. Again, make sure you're watering all the way through twice. Water once to get the root ball wet and once to flush any salt cell. So you got the trifoliate leaf like the one I showed you. Um, and I think I showed you how to remove it. Go ahead and cut it off. You don't need that trifoliate um, rootstock. Eventually, that will go away. Um, once you got your once you've got your trunk established and the tree gets a little more mature, 
um, usually three, four years into it. If you've kept the um, trifoliate rootstock off from your plant, it won't come back. So peat trees, um, it, we've had a, a few uh, years in a row here where it's been real challenging in Southern California to get the fruit to set on some of these deciduous trees. And, and we've been having the, the same problem in the nursery with our stock plants. Um, it, it seems like you, you set the flower, it's a beautiful flowering um, peach tree one day and you come back in the next and the wind has ripped them all off before they got, uh, before they were pollinated. Or the rain will hit real hard and when it's in bloom and knock all those blooms off before they get pollinated. I think the big thing is if you're setting flowers, you got to have some pollinators around um, bees may, for the most part. Um, other insects will, will pollinate peaches and, and nectarines, but mainly it's done with bees. Um, planting some other plants in, in the um, general area to attract bees may be one way of doing it. Um, again, make sure you've got plenty of phosphorus in your, uh, in your soil. Yeah, uh, if you go, um, I'm, I'm not a huge Facebook fan, but if you go on Facebook, there are umpteen groups of people that grow um, urban, urban fruit growers. Um, sometimes they're called gorilla growers because they'll pick an empty lot and they'll just start growing fruit trees in them. Um, they'll plant seeds like Johnny Appleseed throughout the neighborhood and watch what trees um, grow. Um, and then there's also legitimate ones that got community gardens and like tree people that um, distribute fruit trees throughout um, Southern California and do a really nice job on, on helping people succeed with their fruit trees. Um, I think it's a great idea um, building those communities. Uh, there's one that comes to mind that is, is very popular and well established in Southern California. It's called California Rare Fruit Growers. And um, Emmy will have that uh, link on, on the website for you as well, or in the notes here. Um, I still go to them and, and ask questions. You've got people there that have been growing um, certain varieties of fruit for 20 and 30 years and are, would be a, such a wealth of information to talk to. You've got um, several people that do just dragon fruit or do just avocados and, and they've been doing it for so much longer and just one specific variety of fruit than I have that um, I still use them as a resource. So that would be a good place to start. I'm sure Emmy's got some ideas of other, uh, other organizations like uh, tree people that, that do plant trees and throughout Southern California create the um, urban food forests. Yes, definitely. I put in the chat, but we will be, all the links you know that Daniel's sharing in his talk it will be sent out in an email. So look forward to that and um, do you mind reading the questions out loud so people can oh, know? I'm sorry. Yep, no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So can you clone fruit trees, stone fruit trees? Um, yeah. If uh, So what we do is basically cloning. When you graft, you're taking a clone from the, from the mother scion. You're, you're cutting the mother tree. You're cutting your scion from and putting it on a rootstock and you're um, creating a clone. Um, people get kind of weird about cloning things, but in reality, that's what we're doing. We're, we're creating an exact replica of the, of the mother tree. Um, as far as a mission fig tree, you can probably just take a cutting and, and I, I don't like telling people this because it puts nurseries out of business, but you have uh, had success with your mission fig tree by just probably taking a cutting and sticking it in the ground or in water and watching it root or um, in, in peat in peat and perlite mix and watching it root, absolutely that, that can be done and, and you'll have exactly the same tree. Um, that being said, I've kind of touched on something that um, a lot of people have had happen to them in Southern California is the kids go to school, they take their avocado uh, seed to school and they stick the toothpicks in it and they put it over the jar and they keep the water going and then the, and then the roots show and, and it's a great learning experience for kids and then the, the top breaks open and the leaves start coming, the cotyledon comes out and the, now you've got a, a plantable um, avocado tree. 
and a lot of those avocado trees make it to the ground. And um, then five or 10, 15 years later, that family moves and a new family moves in and they've got this beautiful avocado tree that doesn't produce avocados. They make a great shade tree, but um, there's no avocados coming off from it. And the reason that is, is because it was grown from a seedling. Um, Reverna Nursery uses seedling avocados to grow up and then we graft onto those. So that way I can tell you that you're getting a, a Haas avocado tree because I've grafted it from the mother scion tree that's actually producing Haas avocados that I know is a producing a Haas avocado tree. And then I can sell that to you. So that's a, an exact clone of, of that mother tree. Um, these seedlings, especially with um, avocados, the odds of getting fruit are very, very slim. And if you even do get fruit from them, they, um, they typically are not the same kind of fruit that the uh, seed came from. So keep that in mind if you take over a house and, and they've got an avocado tree that's big, beautiful shade tree, but there's no avocados on it. Got a seven-year-old salad tree growing in a pot, good for you. Lemon is the only fruit we get and so many branches than others. How drastic do I prune it? Also, the squirrels ate all of our pluots before they ripen. Um, again, I mentioned about the squirrels. Um, I trap squirrels at my house, um, take them up to the, the woods because uh, I get rid of them. I, out in the field somewhere, I try and just keep relocating them. It's a, it's a constant battle. Um, the lemon tree is going to eventually take over your seven-year-old salad tree you need to cut it back drastically. When I'm pruning my um, um, salad trees here in the nursery, I will take that lemon branch back to the inside of the canopy of the rest of the trees. So for instance, if this was a, um, a fruit salad, say we've got two or three of them here on, on here, and this is the lemon tree, I would bring it back to the inside of the canopy. You see how much, how drastic I would cut it. Back inside the, the canopy, it's going to branch out a couple of times and start growing again. Don't worry about that. And it'll give the, the other two or three varieties, whatever you've got on there, a chance to, um, a chance to grow. So yeah, be, be pretty hard on your, um, on your Eurekas. Otherwise, they'll take over the, the fruit salad tree. Can you re please repeat the point on watering three feet away? Um, I was um, referring more to um, the mulch three inches deep, three inches away from the trunk and three feet out from the trunk. Um, again, if you can go further than that, it's better. Um, people think that the feeder roots stop at the drip line of a tree, which is absolutely not true. Um, feeder roots can go for yards, 10, 20, 100 yards away from a full grown tree. So the drip line where it may contain a large portion of them doesn't contain all your feeder roots. Um, and as long as we're on the, um, on the subject, you don't want your irrigation spraying the trunk of your tree. So once it's, uh, once it's established, you can move that, that whatever type of uh, um, uh, emitter you have on your irrigation and get it away from the trunk of your tree. You know, you'll have a healthier tree. What is the best leaf source to create the decaying leaf? Um, I always tell people when, I think you're referring to the um, avocados that I was, I was talking about, never ever clean up your leaf litter around an avocado tree. I know it looks messy for some people and they hate to see the leaves blown around the, the yard, but the best mulch for an avocado tree is the dead and decaying um, leaf mulch that comes off from the avocado tree. So don't rake that up. Um, I had some ambitious employees here at the nursery that went around and raked all the, I had about two feet deep of uh, leaves in my, uh, in my avocado grove. And um, we, we ended up taking them back out of the trash and going and dumping them back on, on the, uh, back on the ground around it. So uh, mulch, what do you do with dead branches on a Meyer lemon? <clears throat> So mulch, um, there's several different kinds of mulch you can get. Um, I think some of the um, um, green waste, the, the uh, dumps are creating a nice mulch. I've seen the one at Lopez Canyon. And by the way, they have um, gardening classes there on occasion as well. So um, 
you can go there and you can get mulch. Um, they sell mulch at the garden centers. Um, anything is better than nothing. Um, I don't like the rubber mulch, the non-organic mulch. You don't want to use that. Um, you want to use bark mulch or um, branches. Anytime you get a branch that dies in your, in your trees, you can cut it up real fine. Or if you've got one of the chippers, you can run it through that. Um, dead branches on a Meyer lemon tree, you want to prune out. And you try and prune out to the point where you go back to live tissue. When you prune trees and you prune them hard, like you may have to do on your Meyer lemon, you like to use a whitewash to protect the trunk and any major branches, especially on, on um, avocados or uh, cherimoyas where the bark is a little more supple. You want to definitely want, when you re-expose areas of the tree that weren't exposed typically to the sun, you want to whitewash them. The easiest whitewash that I tell people to, to make and the cheapest is 50% um, latex paint white latex paint and 50% water. Spray it on the, on the trunk, spray it on the branches. Um, you're gonna have a white tree for a while, but um, eventually it'll wash away and you've um, basically put a sunscreen on your, on your tree so it doesn't burn. Should I remove fruit as it sets out of the usual season um, after we harvest our first crop of apples? It flowered again in October, set a few apples, possibly because of the warm weather. Yeah, I, in Southern California, you're, you're going to, we have harvested our first um, apple crop and a new transplant that flowered again and, and set fruit again. Um, I doubt that that fruit is going to get to the size where you're going to want to eat it. So I would go ahead and pick it off. I would assume here within the next week or so of this cold weather that you're going to be dropping leaves on that apple tree. And it's probably best not to have the fruit hanging on it. Are there native fruit trees or bushes to Southern California that you would recommend growing? Um, that's a really good question and I should probably know better. I can't think of any, any off the top of my head that are native to Southern California. Um, we have imported so many plants over the decades that we've lived here that um, it's hard to say. As far as growing in the desert, um, some of your more drought tolerant plants are figs, pomegranates. Um, it, those two come to mind real quickly. So th those would do well for you in, a, in say a natural environment. Um, we do have a, a closer you get to the ocean. We've got more of a Mediterranean climate where um, you know fruit trees do real well and your citrus trees or um, avocados, um, they'll do fine. I have a large orange tree, probably 50 years old. Oh, that's great. I hope, hope you're still getting fruit from it. Do citrus fruits need to be thinned out like stone fruits? No, not typically. I, I wouldn't worry about thinning um, oranges. And how much should I prune if it doesn't have any dead, diseased, or deranged branches? That's a hard thing to say. You got a 50 year old fruit tree, uh, um, orange tree, I would assume it's probably 30 or 40 feet tall. And if you're okay with that, and I would leave it that way. I personally keep all my fruit trees so I don't have to get a ladder out and pick, or if I do, I have a picking pole that I can reach rather quickly. Um, I like to keep my fruit trees between 10 and eight, 10, 12 feet tall, which you have to do a lot of pruning to do that. And yes, you'll cut some flower and sometimes you'll cut some fruit off, but it makes it easier for me to harvest the fruit. Um, Daniel. I'm sorry? Um, so there's around four minutes left until 4 p.m. Okay. And um, I just wanted to say that um, the rest of the questions that we might not be able to answer, I think we can maybe answer like one or two left. But I did have a question from one of our community organizers who you know do a lot of the fruit distributions in um, in Los Angeles. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit on like soil contamination and soil health. If your soil is contaminated, is it advised like not to grow fruit trees or, or how do you have any advice on that? Yeah, I guess it would depend on, on the contamination that, that they're talking about. Um, if it's, um, you know, if it's contaminated with a Phytophthora a fungus, you know, you can always plant different types of fruit trees that aren't uh, susceptible to it. For instance, uh, um, 
root rot is will take out down a, a um, an avocado tree in a heartbeat, but you can grow citrus trees in phytophthora ridden um, um, uh, soil. If it's contaminated with oils or um, non-organic materials, then it's usually just something you need to remove and, and um, take out and, and replace the soil and start over again. Right, okay. Um, someone, Steph is saying in the chat near the freeway, like air pollutants. Maybe. Yeah, he, I, I would assume that there's going to be some buildup there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so concerned about it. As a matter of fact, you'd probably be doing yourself a favor by planting fruit trees there and actually um, developing a, a better soil profile with a mulch and taking care of, of the soil rather than leaving it bare for the um, pollution to settle on. Great, thank you. So I think um, we have time for one more question, which is by John, do you need mulch if there's tree in a pot? You, need, you will do best if it does have mulch on the top of the, of the pot, yes. Well, that was a quick answer, so maybe yeah. we can <laughs> answer one more question. Okay, how tall should I let my avocado tree grow? It grows too tall and the bottom branches die off. Start pruning that top branch, that leader that goes out, um, that leader that goes straight up to the sky, cut that back. Again, make sure that you um, whitewash the tree that's exposed and um, that you don't let it sunburn, but you can keep avocado trees small as well, but it's real hard to do because you're gonna be pruning off fruit or you're gonna be pruning off flower because they fruit and flower all the time and there's just no downtime on an avocado. You're gonna be, you're gonna be cutting fruit. Awesome. Thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge. I feel like you just you know went through the questions and and answered them so well. I know there's a lot of questions still unanswered and um, I believe Daniel is open to answering them in an email. So yeah. I think what we'll do is, um, is have the document and Daniel can place the questions there, um, you know, maybe this week or next week and we can send that out to the participants. Okay. And and um, would you mind if people, if we include your, include your email and contact information in the follow-up email so that people can ask you additional questions? Would Absolutely. that be all right with you? Yeah, feel free to do so. Um, again, the, the best way of getting an answer from me is through email. Uh, my phone rings off the hook most of the day. So um, don't, don't feel like I'm ignoring you if you don't get a hold of me. But emails, um, I, I try and get to them at least within a day or two. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for answering the questions, for the information. I know I'm very excited about fruit trees now. I have um, tomatoes in my balcony, but in the future, I want to grow more fruit trees. And I also want to say that we have um, pruning videos and um, we have a pruning video and, a, and another video, which I can't remember right now, but they're up on our YouTube channel um, as part of Fruit Week. They're very quick and informative. So check those videos out. And this video will be recorded and sent out to you all with links and resources. So follow us on social media. And thank you again to, to Daniel from Laverne Nursery. Thank you everybody for paying attention and I appreciate it. Um, please use my email and I'd be more than happy to answer any more questions. Great, well have a wonderful rest of your Thursday, late afternoon, evening and we hope to see you next time. I'm gonna play some music as people are leaving. Choose like that. Um, Emmy, I can answer those questions that are left over on that um, document oh. if you want. Is there a yes. way? Should Please I? Do. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was saying yes, you can. Okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. And then how do I, I just email it back to you? Um, yes, yes, okay. that would be good. Oh, I thought you meant like answering them right now, but. Oh, I can, sure, I can, I can go through them now if you want, yeah. I mean, people are leaving, but you know, I was just gonna play a little bit of music while they were leaving. But um, I'm gonna stop the live stream.
So, Let's oh, see. we forgot to ask you what your favorite fruit variety is. Oh, okay. Um, I was thinking about that uh, quite a bit, and I've got so many that I break it down to varieties. Um, the one I really like, after you try a cherimoya, you probably um, will find most fruit not quite as appetizing. Um, cherimoyas, if you have not had one, please go down to um, the market and grab one and eat it when it's soft. It is a wonderful, wonderful piece of fruit. I like my Vietnamese, uh, also known as Dr. White. It's a nice, big, huge piece. Um, avocados that we just started doing is called Jan Voice. Um, it's an extremely creamy, nice piece of fruit. Um, it's going to be a rival for uh, Haas in my in my mind. Um, I, if I had to pick my favorite orange, I would only grow Cara Caras. It's a pink fleshed um, navel, super sweet, great piece of fruit. Um, Loquats, I like champagne. Champagne loquat is really good. Big Jim is larger, but the champagne's got a little um, um, sweeter taste to it. I got a lot of favorites. I love loquats as well. Mm -hmm. I, I was in um, uh, Bermuda ones and they grow wild along walking down the street and you just pick them as you're walking oh down. there's loquats actually on my street yeah mm -hmm. yeah i have a i'm blessed to be living in a street with many trees and there's around three loquats